1995, at the age of 19, I stood in the bathroom of a military entrance processing station contemplating my future. And I flipped a coin. Heads, I would stay in college and live a largely predictable life. Tails, I would join the Army. You've probably guessed by now how the coin landed. To be clear, joining the military was completely out of character for me. Growing up, I was the kid who loved to read books, write short stories. I had no immediate family members who had served. I'd never fired a weapon or even run longer than a mile. But a funny thing happened. It turns out I was great at being a soldier. I loved the discipline and the sense of purpose that the Army gave me. I excelled on my final PT test when I graduated from boot camp. At the M16 range, I earned sharpshooter on my very first try. In fact, during my three-year enlistment, I was awarded two Army Commendation Medals for meritorious service. The first, for my work as a public affairs officer in San Antonio, Texas, as a private. For you non-military folks, that's a full rank below private first class. The second ARCOM I earned for my work as a lifeguard while stationed at Camp Humphreys, Korea, where I once helped save a Korean soldier from drowning. I loved being a soldier, and I was good at it. In fact, the only reason I got out was because I became pregnant with my daughter, and I really wanted to return to school. But when I got home, it seemed all the rules had changed. My marriage fell apart. I constantly lost my patience with my toddler. My bank account was almost always overdrawn. And at my job, I found my own performance review from my boss on the printer, and I was so ashamed that I locked myself in the bathroom at work for 20 minutes just to regain my composure. What had worked with me in the Army was not working for me in the civilian world. I fell into a deep depression, and I actually considered re-enlisting in the military. At least there, I knew all the rules. You see, the Army taught us how to shine our boots and march in formation and a million other things, but it didn't teach us that there is an art to being a veteran. Instead, we are forced to figure it out all on our own, and so many of us struggle. But in the 25 years since I've left the Army, I've discovered seven mindsets that are critical to success after service. What if no other veteran had to struggle like I did? What if there was a roadmap that showed veterans and anyone else who wanted to learn how to live a life of meaning and purpose? It would teach us vets new definitions of words like courage and compassion and life purpose. Armed with this knowledge, I believe we can tap into our country's largest pool of brave, diverse leaders of integrity. Today, I'm only gonna talk about five. To hear the other two, You'll have to seek me out after the presentation. Shall we begin? So the first is resilience. And during my first couple weeks working at the university, helping military-connected students, I received a call from a student veteran who was dropping out. His grades were terrible. He stopped going to class a long time ago. School just wasn't for him. I tried everything I could to try to get him to stay, but his mind was made up. Before he hung up, he told me, at this point, it would be easier for me to go back to Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Imagine that. Being deployed to a combat zone was actually easier than taking Psych 101. You see, there's a certain kind of resilience that works in combat zones. But it's a different kind of resilience than what works in the cl classroom or the workplace. But regardless of where you find yourself, the research on resilience says that there are three things that all resilient people do. First, resilient people accept reality. They see the situation clearly and don't try to sugarcoat it. Second, resilient people deeply believe that their struggle is meaningful. Whether they're fighting fires or emptying bedpans, their suffering serves a larger purpose. And finally, 
resilient people have an uncanny ability to improvise. Whether cracking jokes or just simply asking for help, resilient people find new ways to solve old problems. I don't know what happened to that student, and I probably will never find out, but I still think about him all the time, and I wonder, will he ever have the chance to learn a new kind of resilience? Next is self-compassion. When I was learning to fire my weapon, my M16 had a small piece of plastic attached to the side of the gun, known as a brass deflector. You see, I'm left-handed, and this meant that when I'm firing my weapon, the hot, spent shell casings would fly out of the chamber and sometimes burn the side of my face. It was very hard to focus on my firing when this was happening. But the brass deflector kept the casings from touching my bare skin so I could focus on hitting my target. Those shell casings have always reminded me of the negative, shameful thoughts that I fire at myself over and over and over again. So I've had to teach myself that when I notice those thoughts, to say, leave those thoughts where they lie. They will only burn you. Self-compassion has been key to all of my success post-military. It's also been the hardest to learn. Brené Brown was right when she wrote, shame corrodes the very part of us that believes we are capable of change. When we lack self-compassion, we do one of two things. We either attack ourselves and our best intentions, or we cover up our failings with excuses. Neither of these helps us get closer to our goals. Self-compassion protects us from ourselves. The way I see it, self-compassion is the armored personnel carrier of emotional intelligence. We need its protection so that we can complete our next mission. Belonging. When my students visit me in my office, they see this Norman Rockwell painting. It's a soldier who's returned from war with his neighbors, family, and friends, I think even the mailman's there, all around him, listening intently. He's holding a Japanese flag in his hands. This painting has struck me as what's missing from America and its relationship with its vets today. We need to redefine our contract with our veterans. Every day, a used car dealerships and sporting events, many Americans repeat the same meaningless words when they don't know what to say to veterans. Thank you for your service. I think mostly people say this to make themselves feel better. But any vet who's being honest will tell you this is actually really awkward for most of us. You're essentially saying, you're different from us. You're over there, we're over here. There's something in between us. Instead, I often advise people to say, thank you for your sacrifice. Because regardless if you served in Baghdad or in Battle Creek, Michigan, we all gave up something to serve our country. It's also nice when folks ask you small things about your service. What branch were you in? What job did you do? Where were you stationed? all perfectly acceptable questions to ask. This builds space for real, meaningful relationships to develop. Interestingly, in Israel, where military service is mandatory for all citizens over the age of 18, they have much lower rates of PTSD among their service members, despite facing many more combat situations. Israelis have all shared the burden they have a shared understanding of what it means to serve their country. There's no one to thank, no one to hold up as different, because everyone did their part. Here in the US, fewer than 1% of Americans have participated in our latest wars. Add their direct family members, and it's still only about 5% of the population. We other vets all the time, we don't listen, we don't give them the space they need to tell their stories, to be whole human beings. Let's, as a society, make more space in our classrooms, in our boardrooms, in our communities, to have deeper conversations about what it means to serve and for veterans to belong in new ways. Self-awareness. So, at the beginning of my talk, I told you all about how great I was at being a soldier. 
And I was, up until a point, until everything fell apart. You see, when I worked at the pool, I experienced some of the most unrelenting, excruciating sexual harassment at the hands of one of my colleagues, which culminated one night in a physical attack in the barracks. I did end up reporting the harassment, and the Army reassigned us both to new jobs. And that individual, as far as I know, never had to face what he did to me. As far as the Army was concerned, it was like it never happened. It didn't matter. And I internalized that message so that I started to believe that I didn't matter. And for years, I truly believed that. I went about my life lying to myself about who I was and how I had suffered. It wasn't until just this year, when I finally faced my trauma and finally filed a claim with the VA so that I could process it and finally move forward. It was some of the most difficult work I have ever done, but also the most rewarding. To the veterans in this room and anyone else who might be living with unprocessed trauma, no, it does affect you, even if you don't want it to even if you do everything else right. It will follow you around into your dreams, into your workplace, into your relationships with your families. If you're going to be successful, I implore you, stop lying to yourself and get the help that you need. Finally, we have transcendence. You've probably noticed my colleague here on the stage with me. This is Hannah, she's my guide dog. In 2017, I was diagnosed with a rare degenerative genetic condition called retinitis pigmentosa. About one in 4,000 people have this condition. As you can see, my retinas, those are pictures of them up there, are full of holes. To me, they look a little bit like a cross section of sourdough bread. This means that I am legally blind, able to see only a fraction of what most of you can see. I could not remain the old person I had been before my vision loss. But I also could not just immediately become a whole new person, a blind person. I had to integrate all of my old identities into one. Over the years, I have been a soldier, a professor, an entrepreneur, a mom, and an outdoors woman. I've also been a victim of sexual violence and gender discrimination and I've suffered from a disease that will eventually consume all of my usable vision. But it wasn't until I took the time to really bring all of these things together that I was able to create a third way. I am something more whole, more powerful, more human, because I have transcended my, my struggles. And no one can take that away from me. We need to do the work of aligning both the worst and the best of ourselves. We must own every aspect of ourselves, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because in the end, it's all part of us. It's who we are. Once we can transcend our old selves, we can create something new. And then we become unstoppable. So I'm going to leave you with this final statistic. Since 9-11, over 7,000 service members have been killed in combat and over four times that number have died from suicide. 30,000 lives lost. Now, I don't tell you this because I want to reinforce old stereotypes about veterans being ticking time bombs of PTSD. I'm telling you this because I really want you to see the potential here. Here's another statistic. 650,000 veterans leave the service every year with a wealth of transferable leadership experience. And when they leave the military and enter the workforce, that experience, that discipline, that ability to work across cultures that they gained while in uniform, it stays with them. But sometimes, so does the fear and the hurt and the inability to cut themselves some slack. That's why we need to reteach veterans and ourselves new definitions of words like resilience, courage, and compassion, belonging, life purpose, self-awareness, and transcendence. The leadership potential here is enormous. Using these seven 
concepts, we can help introduce radical new way of integrating veterans' lived experiences and then translate them into civilian leadership pipeline that brings positive, deep-seated change to the companies, nonprofits, and government agencies and the families where they work, live, and play. Together, using new mindsets, we can build bridges for veterans to create new lives full of meaning and purpose. And that, I believe, is an idea worth spreading.